The Gospel of John chapter 19 and verse number 11. John chapter 19. And we'll actually begin reading in verse number 7, and we'll read down through verse 11, from 7 to 11, and then I'll be preaching out of verse number 11. A sermon titled, Sovereign Power from Above. Verse number 7, the Jews answered him, We have a law, and by our law he ought to die because he made himself the son of God. When Pilate therefore heard that saying, he was the more afraid and went again into the judgment hall and said unto Jesus, whence art thou? But Jesus gave him no answer. Then saith Pilate unto him, speakest thou not unto me? Now watch this, this is, this you need to pay attention right here. Pilate is worried He's just been told that Jesus claims to be the Son of God. Pilate is worried now. He's, he's already uncomfortable with this whole scenario. He's already uncomfortable with this whole trial. And now he's just been told that this man in front of him is possibly the Son of a God. And so he calls Jesus back into the judgment hall and he said, Whence art thou? Now, he doesn't mean what community, what town, what neighborhood. He means, are you from heaven? Okay? And Jesus gave him no answer. We dealt with that, why Jesus did not answer him. Now, watch this. Verse 10. Then Pilate saith unto him. Now, Pilate's, get, Pilate's getting threatening here, okay? He's puffing out his chest, and he's, he's, gonna, he's going to try to threaten Jesus with his authority. And Pilate said unto him, Speakest thou not unto me? Knowest thou not that I have power to crucify thee and power to release thee? Now we dealt with that a couple of weeks ago. Pilate has here just condemned himself in his own words. But he threatens Jesus and say, why aren't you answering me? Don't you understand? I have the power to crucify you. I have the power to set you free. Verse 11 is our text. Jesus answered, Thou couldest have no power at all against me, except it were given thee from above. Therefore, he that delivered me unto thee hath the greater sin. Jesus said, You would have no power at all over me, except it were given to you from above. And then he said, He that delivered me unto thee hath the greater sin. Now the last three sermons from John 19 were preached from my home office. And you might think I like that, but I don't. I would rather preach from here. Although during the first seven weeks of COVID, I did get used to, and I did really like preaching on my front porch in my rocker. Uh, I really did like that. But I would much rather be here with you, seeing you face to face and preaching to you in person. But the last three sermons from John 19 were preached from my office. January 24th, I preached, crucify him, crucify him. January 31st, I preached, whence art thou? February 7th, I preached, Pilate washed his hands. And then February 14th was supposed to be Brother David Rasmussen preaching on the love of God. But we once again met online at the last second, and I preached a sermon uh, that I had preached in 2011 titled, The Suffering of Faith. And then last Sunday, February 21st, David Rasmussen preached an excellent sermon on love. This morning, I want us to come here to verse 11, and I want us to see Jesus' response to Pilate's threat. Pilate says, why aren't you answering me? Don't you know I have the power? I have the authority to crucify you, to kill you. I also have the power and authority to set you free. If you remember, Jesus was silent when Pilate asked, whence art thou? And I explained the reason behind Jesus' silence. And Pilate, who was now even more afraid and more agitated, 
starts flexing his authority and threatening Jesus. I preached on that topic the last time we were here in John's Gospel. But I want us to consider Christ's response. Thou could have no power against me except that were given thee from above. In his response to Pilate, Jesus honors God the Father and he rebukes Pilate. Jesus, in this one statement, extols the sovereignty of God and he exposes the impotence of man and the sin of man. Now Jesus acknowledged that Pilate had power. Jesus acknowledges that Pilate does have authority. But the power and authority that Pilate has is not what he thinks it is. Okay? Uh, Pilate thinks that his authority is arbitrary. That it's discretionary. That he has the power within himself to do what he wants to do or to do what he feels he should do. Pilate thinks that that power that he has is, is arbitrary to him, that it's absolute to him, that, that the, the whole thing rests upon his shoulders, and that he and he alone has got the power uh, to kill Jesus or let him free. Pilate thinks that his power is his own, and he thinks that he alone makes the decisions, and he thinks that he, Pilate, absolutely believes that he is sovereign over this uh, great Roman Empire, or at least this section of it, and he thinks that he can do as he pleases. Okay? Pilate believes that in this section of the Roman Empire, this part that he has been given authority over, he believes that he can do as he pleases and that uh, his power is absolute. What Pilate does not know is that this kind of power and authority only comes from above. No man on this earth is truly sovereign. Now I know that is the title that is given to kings, especially over in, uh, in Great Britain. Uh, kings have been called sovereigns. And as a matter of fact, there are, uh, I believe, uh, money, tokens of money that are called a sovereign. Uh, but nobody, no man is truly sovereign in this earth, on this earth. Regardless of uh, what we may call an emperor or a king, no man on this earth has supreme power. No man on this earth has ultimate, arbitrary, absolute power. No man does. He may think he does, but no man does. Now, I'm not denying that there are powerful men and powerful women. I'm not denying that there are powerful rulers. Now, I'm not denying that there have been powerful kings in the past and powerful emperors. What I'm saying is that no one ever in this world has absolute power except our God, except our Creator except our Lord and Master. Our God is the only one that has absolute power. Jesus tells Pilate that he could have no power at all against him except it were given to him from God above. In other words, he's saying to Pilate, if you crucify me, you will only crucify me because God lets you crucify me. That's what he's saying. Romans chapter 13 and verse number 1. Let every soul be subject unto the higher powers. For there is no power but of God. There is no power but of God. The powers that be are ordained of God. Anyone that believes that they have absolute, arbitrary, uh, sovereign power, anyone that thinks that they have unlimited power, does not understand that they get that power, they get that authority from God. God is the fountainhead 
We often say he's the fountainhead of all blessings, but God is also the fountainhead of all power and of all authority. The streams of power among creation flow down from God. The power that a man has over all of the creatures of the earth. And we see this in the book of Genesis. The power that man has over the birds of the air and the fish of the sea and the beast of field and forest. That power, that authority comes from God. As a matter of fact, in the garden, God gave Adam dominion over all the earth, dominion over all the animals, the fish, and the birds. God gave him that dominion gave him that power and gave him that authority the authority that a man has over his wife that parents have over their children that masters have over their servants or employers have over their employees that princes and kings have over their subjects all of that power comes from God all of it comes from God it is the God of heaven that sets up kings and pulls them down. It is the God of heaven that sets up presidents and pulls them down. It was over a decade ago, probably more like 11 years ago, when I was reading and studying about Nebuchadnezzar in the book of Daniel, that I came to realize and begin to understand that God is sovereign over all. Again, it was about 10 or 11 years ago. I believe I was studying for a sermon there in the book of Daniel. And uh, I'll never forget uh, coming face to face uh, with the understanding and begin to realize, and my eyes begin to open, that God is sovereign over all. The acknowledgement of the sovereignty of God completely changed my view and understanding of God. And, and I believe that if you as a believer will come uh, face to face with the truth of the sovereignty of God over all things, that it would begin to change your view of God and your view of the scriptures as well. Nebuchadnezzar uh, was the... Um, a longest reigning and most powerful monarch of the uh, new Babylonian Empire or the Chaldean Empire. Um, 600 years before Christ, Nebuchadnezzar reigned, again, the longest and the most powerful monarch over Babylon. Uh, he besieged and conquered Judah, which was the southern kingdom of, one, uh, of what once was a united Israel. Okay? And so, uh, but uh, the, the, the nation of Israel split. You had your northern and your southern kingdom. The northern kingdom was uh, known as Israel. The southern kingdom was known as Judah. They both had separate kings. And uh, Nebuchadnezzar besieged and conquered the southern kingdom of Judah and uh, uh, took captives. And among those captives, you'll recognize these names. Among those many captives that Nebuchadnezzar took, there was Daniel. And then we know them by their new names, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. The book of Daniel deals a lot with Nebuchadnezzar's dreams and Daniel's interpretation of those dreams with the help of God. I want to break into the middle of the text, and I want us to look at Daniel's interpretation of one particular dream, and I want us to look at the events that followed. This passage really supports what Jesus is saying to Pilate. And that's why I want to go there, okay? And this passage that we're about to look at, Daniel chapter 4, you can go ahead and make your way over there, Daniel chapter 4, it is this passage that really changed my view of God, okay? I was able to learn what Nebuchadnezzar learned without going through what he went through. Daniel chapter 4. Now we're going to break into the middle of a, of, of a, a scenario here, a, a, 
I don't know what to call it. The word escapes me a, a story, for lack of a better word. But we're going to break into the middle. Daniel chapter 4. The king has already told Daniel his dream. And we're just going to break in here on the interpretation of the dream. And the interpretation is going to give us an idea of what, uh, what was dreamed. Daniel 4 and verse nine, 19. Then Daniel, whose name was Belteshazzar, that was his new name. They gave everyone new names when they came into Babylon. Then Daniel, whose name was Belteshazzar, was astonished for one hour. After the, after the king told him his dream, he was astonished for one hour. And his thoughts troubled him. The king spake and said, Belteshazzar, let not the dream or the interpretation thereof trouble thee. Belteshazzar answered and said, My lord, the dream be to them that hate thee, and the interpretation thereof to thine enemies. In other words, when the king told Daniel the dream, Daniel was upset because this was not a good dream for Nebuchadnezzar. This was a bad dream. Daniel was a little afraid to tell Nebuchadnezzar the meaning of the dream. Nebuchadnezzar said, Daniel, don't worry, just tell me the meaning. And Daniel said, well, this really benefits your enemies. Verse 20, the tree that thou sawest, which grew and was strong, whose height reached unto the heaven, and the sight thereof to all the earth, whose leaves were fair, and the fruit thereof much, and in it was meat for all, under which the beast of the fields dwelt, and upon whose branches the fowls of heaven and their habitation. It is thou, O king, that art grown and become strong, for thy greatness is grown and reacheth unto heaven and thy dominion to the ends of the earth. So Daniel says, Nebuchadnezzar, here's that tree, that great big tree that you saw is you. That tree that reaches way, way up into the heaven, and that tree that is so wide and so big that it can be seen through all the earth, and that tree that all the birds nest in and all the beasts find shade under, that tree that all the nations eat from the fruit of that tree, that great tree is you, O king. It's you. Your dominion has grown. Your greatness has grown throughout all of the earth. You are a great king. Verse 23, And whereas the king saw a watcher and an holy one coming down from heaven and saying, Hew the tree down and destroy it. Yet leave the stump of the roots thereof in the earth, even with a band of iron and brass, in the tender grass of the field, and let it be wet with the dew of heaven, and let his portion be with the beast of the field, and let his portion be with the beast of the field, till seven times pass over him. This is the interpretation, O king, and this is the decree of the Most High, which has come upon my Lord the king, that they shall drive thee from men, and thy dwelling shall be with the beast of the fields. Now listen, Daniel said, this tree, this great tree, it's you, king, it's you. Your greatness has gone throughout all of the earth. Your greatness has reached the heavens. But it's going to be cut down. And that tree is going to lay in the field and be covered over with dew. The only thing that will remain will be a stump. That is you. Verse 25 they shall drive thee from men, and thy dwelling shall be with the beast of the field. And they shall make thee to eat grass as oxen, and they shall wet thee with the dew of heaven, and seven times shall pass over thee, till thou know that the Most High ruleth in the kingdom of men, and giveth it to whomsoever he will. What Daniel is saying is, you're going to learn a lesson. You're a great king in all the earth. You're the greatest king in all the earth. But you're going to be cut down. And you're going to be driven out to live among the animals. Until you learn 
that the Most High ruleth in the heavens, and he ruleth upon the earth, and he ruleth, and he giveth to whomsoever he will. Nebuchadnezzar, you need to learn that your greatness and your power and your strength is from God. Verse 26, And whereas they commanded to leave the stump of the tree roots, thy kingdom shall be sure unto thee. After that thou shalt have known the heavens do rule. When you figure out that the heavens do rule, and that the power comes from God above, your kingdom will be restored to you. That's why the stump was to be left. The kingdom will be restored to you. Once you learn that the heavens do rule. Wherefore, O king, let my counsel be acceptable unto thee, and break off thy sins by righteousness, and thine iniquities by showing mercy to the poor, if it may be a lengthening of thy tranquility. Daniel said, listen, listen, I'm begging you, King Nebuchadnezzar. I'm begging you, my Lord, the king. Leave your sin. Leave your sin. Do right so that you can live in tranquility. Daniel explained to him the dream told him that it was him, he was going to be cut down, he was going to be driven out, he was going to live like an animal, and then Daniel warned him, please stop your sinning. Please get right with God. Verse 28, all this came upon King Nebuchadnezzar. At the end of 12 months, so a year had passed, he walked in the palace of the kingdom of Babylon. The king spake and said, now watch this. Are you watching this? Verse 30, the king spake and said, best I can tell, he's talking to himself. Maybe there's some servants he's talking to. But listen to what he says. Is not this great Babylon that, what? I said out loud that, that I have built for the house of the kingdom by the power, by, by the might of what? My power. And for the honor of what? My majesty. This is the kingdom that I have built. It is for, it is because of my power. And it is for my majesty. While the word was in the king's mouth, there fell a voice from heaven saying, O King Nebuchadnezzar, to thee it is spoken, the kingdom is departed from thee. He was right in the smack dab middle of bragging on himself. And while he was still in the middle of that thought, God took the kingdom from him. Verse 32, and they shall drive thee from men. And thy dwelling shall be with the beast of the field. And they shall make thee to eat grass as oxen. And seven times shall pass over thee until thou know that the Most High ruleth in the kingdom of men and giveth it to whomsoever he will. The same hour was the thing fulfilled upon Nebuchadnezzar and he was driven from men and he did eat, he did eat grass as oxen. His body was wet with the dew of heaven till his hairs were grown like eagles' feathers and his nails like birds' claws. Nebuchadnezzar was driven out of the, off the throne, out of the palace, out of the kingdom, and he was driven into the wilderness where he remained for a time. He crawled around like, a, like an ox. He ate grass like an ox. His hair grew like eagle's feathers. His fingernails grew like eagle's talons. No place to get out of the, out of the weather wet, just, I mean, just like an animal. Because he refused to recognize the power of an almighty and sovereign God. And he thought the greatness of the kingdom was because of himself. And he thought that it was to his own honor. 
Now, the Bible says here a few times that he was to remain out there for seven times, be passed over him. Every Bible commentator that I researched, every one of them said that Nebuchadnezzar was out there for seven years. I don't believe that at all. I stand probably alone of 95% of all Bible commentators. There's a phrase there, seven times over him. I believe that Nebuchadnezzar was in the fields as a beast for seven months. And I think that seven times over him would be seven new moons or full moons. I believe it was as the moon goes over him once, one month, twice, lunar months. I believe he was out there for seven lunar months. Um, I, I, I did my research. Uh, your fingernails in, in six months would double in length, okay? Uh, so that would, if you took my nails and doubled them, that would be as though eagle's claws. And if you, if I went seven months without a haircut, I would look like a hippie from the 60s, okay? And so seven months fits the description of him. And this seven times over him, I believe is probably a reference to the seven moons that he saw pass over him, the new moons or full moons. I don't believe it was seven years. I believe it was seven months. Seven months is still a long time to live in the wilderness as an animal. It's still a long time to eat grass like a, like a cow. Seven months. Verse 34, and at the end of the days, okay, not years, but at the end of the days, I, Nebuchadnezzar, lifted up mine eyes unto heaven, and mine understanding returned unto me. And I blessed the Most High, and I praised and honored him that liveth forever, whose dominion is an everlasting dominion, and his kingdom is from generation to generation, and all the inhabitants of the earth are reputed as nothing. And he doeth according to his will in the army of heaven and among the inhabitants of the earth. Nebuchadnezzar finally came to his senses and he says God's dominion and power and kingdom are from everlasting to everlasting. They are over all of the earth and, and God does what he wants among the armies of heaven and he does what he wants among the inhabitants of the earth. And none can stay his hand or say unto him, what doest thou? Nobody, nobody, nobody can stop the hand of God. At the same time, my reason returned unto me, and for the glory of my kingdom, mine honor and brightness returned unto me, and my counselors and my Lord sought unto me, and I was established in my kingdom, and excellent majesty was added unto me. He got it all back. Actually, probably, and more. The Bible says that his reason returned, the glory of his kingdom returned, his own honor returned, brightness returned unto him his counselors and lords gladly received him back he was established once again and his excellent majesty was added unto him now I Nebuchadnezzar praise and extol and honor the king of heaven all whose works are truth and his ways judgment and those that walk in pride he is able to a base. Nebuchadnezzar learned the hard way that there is one God who is Lord over all. Verse number 24, 
he's, this, he says, this is the decree of the Most High. Verse 25, the Most High ruleth in the kingdom of men and giveth it to whomsoever he will. Verse 26, the heavens do rule. Verse 30, he said, Nebuchadnezzar, I have built the power of my might and the honor of my majesty. Verse 32, the Most High, he changes his mind now, the Most High ruleth in the kingdom of men and giveth it to whomsoever he will. Verse 35, the inhabitants of the earth are reputed as nothing. He doeth according to his will. None can stay his hand. None can say, what doest thou? Nebuchadnezzar learned a valuable lesson the hard way. And it was while studying this passage over a decade ago that I came to the face to face with the fact that our God is almighty and he is sovereign and he does what he wants with all that is his and all is his. God does what he wants, he does what he wills, and the most powerful king on earth is no match for God. Psalm 33, if you want to go over there with me. Psalm 33. This is what Jesus is telling Pilate. You think you, you think you have so much power. You think the power is at your discretion, that it's arbitrary, that, it's, that, that your power is absolute, that you can do what you want. No, you can't do what you want. Any power you have is from above. Psalm 33. Rejoice in the Lord, O ye righteous, for praise is comely for the upright. Praise the Lord with a harp. Sing unto him with a psaltery and with the instrument of ten strings. Sing unto him a new song. Play skillfully with a loud noise. For the word of the Lord is right, and all his works are done in truth. He loveth righteousness and judgment. The earth is full of the goodness of the Lord. By the word of the Lord were the heavens made, and all the host of them by the breath of his mouth. He gathereth the waters of the sea together as a heap. He layeth up the depth in storehouses. Let all the earth fear the Lord. Let all the inhabitants of the world stand in awe of him. For he spake and it was done. He commanded and it stood fast. The Lord bringeth the counsel of the heathen to naught. The Lord bringeth the counsel of the heathen to naught. He maketh the devices of the people of none effect. The counsel of the Lord standeth forever. The thoughts of his heart to all generations. Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord and the people whom he hath chosen for his own inheritance. God is the commander of all. He is the Lord of all. And he can bring the counsel of the heathen to nothing. And he can make the devices of the people nothing. Nothing. Psalm 115 and verse number 3 but I, oh, I love this verse. Jacob, I know you love this verse as well. Psalm 115 and verse number three. You ought to highlight it or underline it or memorize it. But our God is in the heavens and he hath done whatsoever he hath pleased. Our God is in the heavens and he hath done whatsoever he hath pleased. Psalm 135 verses three to six. Praise the Lord, for the Lord is good. Sing praise it. Now listen. Listen. He may be absolute. He may be sovereign. He may be Lord of all, Lord over all, but he is still good. He's good. Amen. Sing praises unto his name, for it is pleasant. For the Lord hath chosen Jacob unto himself and Israel for his particular treasure. For I know that the Lord is great, and that our Lord is above all gods. Whatsoever the Lord pleased, that did he in the heaven, and in the earth, and in the seas, and in the deep places. God does what he pleases. He chose Jacob, and he chose Israel as his particular, peculiar treasure. God does what he pleases. God could have chose any nation any man but he chose Jacob and he chose Israel 
And then we're told that God has that right and he chooses whom he pleases. This is God's prerogative. Isaiah 46, 9 to 11. Remember the former things of old. Isaiah 46, 9 to 11. Remember the former things of old. For I am God and there is none else. I am God and there is none like me. Declaring the end from the beginning and from ancient times the things that are not yet done. Saying, my counsel shall stand and I will do all my pleasure. I will do what I please. Now we can't do that. We can't do that. Maybe to a little degree we can do that. Somewhat we can do that. But there are so many authorities over us, there are a lot of things we probably would like to do that we can't do. I would like to not pay taxes. <laughs> yeah. And I'm guessing everyone in here was, who has the same thing, same pleasure. But you can't. You can't do what you please like that, okay? I would like to drive 115 down the interstate, but I can't do that. I, there are a lot of things I would love to do that I cannot do. Why? Because I have different authorities over me. But God does what he pleases. Calling a ravenous bird from the east, the man that executed my counsel from a far country, yea, I have spoken it, I will also bring it to pass, I have purposed it, I will do it. I will do my good pleasure. I will do what I please. If you have a Bible, you want to look at Acts chapter number 4. Acts chapter number 4. Our theme this morning is God is sovereign. He does what he wants. He does what he pleases. No man can stop him. Acts chapter number 4, verses 23 to 31. Peter and John, I believe it is, have just been let go. For they, they had been arrested for preaching the gospel. They had been threatened. Verse 32, And being let go, they went to their own company and reported all that the chief priests and elders had said unto them. And when they heard that, they lifted up their voice to God with one accord and said, Lord, thou art God, which has made the heaven and the earth and the sea and all that in them is, who by the mouth of thy servant David has said, why did the heathen rage and the people imagine vain things? The kings of the earth stood up and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against his Christ. For of a truth against thy holy child Jesus, whom thou hast anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate. Pilate, he is the subject of our text. With the Gentiles and the people of Israel were gathered together. For to do whatsoever thy hand and thy counsel determined before to be done. Okay, now this is important. This goes exactly to our text. Verse 27, For of a truth against thy holy child Jesus, whom thou hast anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate, with the Gentiles and the people of Israel, were gathered together for to do whatsoever thy hand and thy counsel determined before to be done. What was that? The crucifixion. Herod, Pontius Pilate, Gentiles, people of Israel gathered together and they did what the hand of God and the counsel of God determined should be done. That was to crucify Jesus. And now, Lord, behold their threatenings and grant unto thy servants that with all boldness we may speak thy word by stretching forth thy hand to heal and that signs and wonders may be done by the name of thy holy child Jesus. And when they had prayed, the place was shaken where they were assembled together and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and they spake the word of God with boldness. We could spend the remainder of our time reading these type of verses. We could spend the next 25 minutes reading these type of verses. We could spend a whole nother sermon just looking at the examples of the almighty power and authority of a sovereign God. We could just go through and where the Bible does not specifically spell it out in certain words, we could look at different scenarios in which we see that it was God that was all powerful. One of my favorite men to quote, Bishop J.C. Ryle says this in reference to Pilate. Remember, that is our text. Pilate said, don't you know I can, I can kill you or let, set you free? And Jesus said, no, you, you don't have any power except what's given to you from above. J.C. Ryle said this, 
Thou talkest of power. Thou dost not know that both thou and the Jews are only tools in the hands of a higher being. You are both unconsciously mere instruments in the hand of God. The only reason you are crucifying Jesus Christ, the only reason you have the power and the ability to do that, is because God sent his son to die on an old rugged tree. That's the only reason you have the power to do this. Whenever you hear me speak of the sovereignty of God, this is what I mean. God has the right and the authority to do what he wants to do because he is the creator of all things and he owns all things. When you hear me speak of the sovereignty of God, I mean that God has the right and the authority to do what he wants to do because he is the creator of all things and he owns all things. And when I speak of the sovereignty of God, I am saying that God not only has the right and the authority to do these things, but I am saying that God has the power and the ability to do what he wants to do because he is the one true God and he is the almighty God. So he not only has the, the right to do things and the authority to do things, but he has the power and the ability to do exactly what he wants to do and what is his good pleasure. God has the authority and the ability to do what he wants with whomever he wants, whenever he wants, and however he wants. And he does not have to consult with any of us first. All the world is his. Everything in the world is his. The hills are his. The gold inside the hills is his. It's all his. This is my father's world. He can do what he wants, and he does not have to consult with any of us. That's what I mean by sovereign God. He has the right and authority to do what he wants, and he has the power and the ability to do what he wants. And he does all things according to his great wisdom, and he does all things according to his perfect will. God is not some foolish God just popping off everywhere doing a bunch of wacky things. God does everything by his great wisdom and according to his perfect will. And God makes no mistakes. He does all things for his glory. Now listen, brother and sister. He does all things for his glory. Whatever God does, it's for his glory. And it is for our good. God would never do anything that was not for his children's good. He loves us as his children. He loves us. If you're a child of God, if you're born again, he loves you. And he will only do what is good for you. If you can firmly grasp his sovereignty, it'll completely change your view of God. It'll completely change your view of his word. If you can firmly grasp his providence... Providence is the guiding hand of God in our life. God steering us. You know, you ever set uh, your child uh, on your lap as you're running the lawn tractor around? Of course, you've got the blades off, right? You're not mowing, but you're just riding the tractor around. You've got your child on your lap, and, uh, and he's steering, okay? And, uh, he, but he's headed toward the ditch. Well, you just reach under there. He's little. He doesn't know. You just reach under there and you grab that wheel and you turn it away from the ditch, right? You turn it away. He, he thinks he's steering. He thinks he's doing it. I mean, he's like three and he thinks he's steering it. But that's you. You got the wheel. You have done that? All you got, all your dads have done that. Maybe it's in a truck. Maybe it's a six-year-old in a truck and he's driving, you know, and he thinks he's driving. He's headed toward that oak tree. You just reach under there and you, you steer. That's the providence of God. The guiding hand of God. God guides us. And if you can grasp his sovereignty, and if you can grasp his providence, it will completely change your view of your situations. Blessed is the Christian who can rest in God's sovereignty and in his providence. You learn those two things, the providence of God, the guiding hand of God, the sovereignty of God, the authority of God, it will change your life. Now then, 
to be sure, Jesus recognizes Pilate does have authority over him, okay? And he is submitting to that authority. He acknowledged that in this statement, in our text of verse 11. He acknowledges, you have authority over me. But it's only because God has given it to you. Jesus was obedient to that authority. He was obedient to Pilate because he was obedient to death, even the death of the cross, the Bible says. Now, in conclusion, Jesus says, after he extols the sovereignty of God, the power of God, the authority of God, he gives Pilate a warning. And I'm bringing the sermon to a close. Therefore, he that delivered me unto thee hath the greater sin. Jesus points out to Pilate that he is guilty of sin. He's guilty of condemning an innocent man. He is guilty. But he also lays guilt, the greater guilt, he says, the greater, upon those who push this forward and who force the arrest. In other words, the Jewish leadership, the, the chief priest, the high priest, the Sadducees, Pharisees, the scribes, all of that. They pushed this. They pushed and pushed and pushed and pushed. And they forced the arrest of Jesus. And they forced him before Pilate. So Jesus says they have the, the greater guilt. They've committed the greater sin. But Pilate, greater than yours. But you still have committed a sin. You, by your own words, are condemning an innocent man. To be sure, Pilate was guilty. All right? Let's, let's understand that. To be sure, Pilate was guilty. But the Jews were more guilty. Can I take this one step further? You and I are the guiltiest of all. Why? Because it was our sin that Christ was sent here. And it was our sin the reason he had to die. You're not off the hook. Years ago, I, I seen a gospel track. I mean, I'm talking about when I was a little kid. I used to pass out a lot of gospel tracks as a child. And I, I'll never forget one said, the, the outside the front cover said, who killed Jesus? And it went on and talked about how Pilate, the Roman government, killed Jesus. I mean, it was their cross. The Jews didn't crucify. They stoned and did other things. Uh, the ones that crucified hung on a tree. Those were Romans did that. And so the Romans were guilty. And of course... Who else was guilty? Well, the Jews, because they pressed this thing and they pushed him uh, to be arrested. It's just like what, says, what the text says. And then the gospel tract goes on to say, who killed Jesus? Well, you and I did. You and I did. It was our sin that put him on that cross. It was our sin. So Pilate was guilty, but Jesus says the Jews were more guilty. I mean, the getaway driver is guilty, right? But the bank robbers, the ones that actually held the gun and stole the money, they're more guilty. And you may be thinking, wait, 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 and this is where we close. You, you may be thinking, I, I thought all this was designed and decreed by the sovereign, uh, uh, sovereignty of God and the providence of God. You, 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 just, you just read in Acts, you just read that this whole thing was designed by God. How then can Pilate be guilty? If this is God's will, if this was God's plan before the foundation of the world, if this whole thing was designed before the foundation of the world, how can Pilate be guilty? How can the Jews be guilty for something that God planned? You're thinking that, aren't you? A.W. Pink said something along these lines. God's counsels and decrees do not abolish the guilt of the men who execute them. God's counsels and decrees do not abolish the guilt of the men who execute the decrees of God. Luke 22, 20 to 22 says this. This was uh, there at the Lord's Supper, the Last Supper. Remember the upper room, we dealt with it. Likewise also the cup after the supper, saying this cup is the New Testament in my blood which was shed for you. But behold, the hand of him that betrayeth me is with me on the table. Remember, Jesus warned, one of you is going to betray me. Remember that? Jesus says, the hand of you that betrays me is on the table right now. And truly, now watch this. Listen, Luke 2, excuse me, Luke 22, 22. Listen. And truly, the Son of Man goeth as it was determined. 
It was determined before the foundation of the world. The Son of Man goeth as it was determined. But woe unto the man, but woe unto the man by whom he is betrayed. God determined that his son would come and die at the hands of the Jews and the Romans. That was the plan of God. The death of Jesus Christ was not an accident. It was the plan of God. And yet, woe to the man that betrays the Son of God into the hands of the Jews. And that was Judas. Even though this was the plan of God, Judas is held guilty. Acts 2.23 him being delivered by the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God, ye have taken by wicked hands and have crucified and slain. Now look, Acts 2.23, it, it's, it's, it's talking about Jesus dying by the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God. It was planned by God. And yet, and yet Peter says, you've taken him by wicked hands and you have crucified God. The Son of God. You have crucified with your wicked hands the harmless and holy Son of God. This subject of the sovereignty of God and the responsibility of man is far bigger than the few minutes that I have left. But in short, you see both of these in our text and you see both of these in Acts 2.23. Acts 2.23, by the determinate counsel, God has given Pilate the authority to condemn Jesus to death. And yet Pilate is declared guilty and he is held responsible for his sin. You cannot deny that both the sovereignty of God and the responsibility of man are declared in John 19.11. You cannot deny that they are both declared. In the first half of verse 11... The whole thing is designed by God and they couldn't do it unless God gave them the power to do it. Second half of verse number 11, Pilate is guilty and the Jews are guilty. In the case of Judas, it was prophesied by Zechariah that Jesus would be betrayed by 30 pieces of silver. The prophet made known the will of God. He revealed what was ordained by God. The prophet Zechariah revealed what was ordained by God. And what was that? That Jesus would be betrayed for 30 pieces of silver. Was, Ju was Judas responsible for fulfilling the decree of God? Was Judas responsible for fulfilling the, or the ordained thing of God? Was he responsible for that? He was. He was. Luke 22, 22 says he was responsible. You see, in his heart, in Judas' heart, in his nature, he was a greedy, evil man. He loved money. He was a thief. These are what was in his heart and what was in his nature. And therefore, and therefore, it made it easy for him to carry out. He didn't know he was, but it made it easy for him to carry out the decree of God. He was responsible. Judas was responsible. He even condemned himself. Remember when he took the money back? And he said, take this money back. I have betrayed innocent blood. He was responsible. He was guilty. And he knew he was. But it was that evil in his heart and that greed in his heart and that love of money in his heart that drove him to carry out the decree of God. He was responsible. Acts 2.23, which I just quoted. Christ died by the determinate counsel, and yet the Jews are under condemnation for his death. That's because in their heart was wickedness. Wickedness had built up in their heart long before they cried, crucify him, crucify him. In fact, it was the wickedness in their heart that brought them to that point. They were evil hypocrites. They were pretending that they were holy. 
In reality, they were hateful. The Jews, these Jewish leaders, they were hateful. They were envious. They were filled with disbelief. They were liars. They were unjust. They were greedy. They were covetous. They were idolaters. And they are responsible for the wickedness of their hearts that led them to knowingly, or rather unknowingly, fulfill the decree of God. I mean, they knew what they were doing, but they didn't know that they were doing it according to the decree of God. Listen, I'm done. I've been a little long. God does not make his creatures sinful. God does not make his creatures sinful. But he does use their sinfulness to accomplish his purposes. God is not the author of sin, nor is he the approver of sin. But he does use man's own wickedness to accomplish his perfect decrees. Proverbs 16, 9 says this, A man's heart deviseth his way. A man's heart deviseth his way. But the Lord directeth his steps. So man is wicked in his heart, and yet God will use that man, direct his steps to accomplish his will. And what you see in John 19, 11, is you see the sovereignty of an almighty God. And you see the guilt of Pilate and the Jews. May God add his blessing to the preaching and teaching and the reading of his word. May God bless his little flock at Beth Haven.